So what does this all actually mean? We see signs in the heavens, we see constellations, we see astronomical data, we see blood moons, we see eclipses, and obviously all the weather patterns that we see going on. We see Jew and Gentile and the uh, Israel, Israel coming back and Zionism and all these things, but how does it all fit together? In this video, I'm going to go over some topics which you will never have heard before. Um, this is a completely unique perspective. It's from my own research and my own understanding, but I think it fits together quite well. In Genesis 49.10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So Jacob brings all his sons together and blesses them, the 12 tribes of Israel, and says that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. So that's the Messiah coming and arriving in Israel. And when he arrives, the scepter will then depart from Judah, because obviously the Messiah is the scepter and he will rule the world. And another interpretation of that is the scepter turneth not aside from Judah and a lawgiver from between his feet till his seed come and his is the obedience of the people so had the jews and israel accepted the messiah he would have had the obedience of the whole nation but obviously they didn't do that the jewish understanding of the creation itself when the creator created the universe he imbued certain celestial forces with the ability to strongly affect affairs in the terrestrial universe god appointed ministers or angels for each of the nations of the earth who represented their interests in the celestial spheres. This is part of the discipline known as astrology. So we know that the, the fallen angels and the watchers were made responsible for the people and they obviously fell into disobedience. Celestial bodies, their constellations, the times at which each appears in the sky and where in the sky all play a role in the fates of these nations. And we're going to uh, go into scripture that confirms this as well. All this occurs under the guidance of the supreme authority, Hashem, seeing that these bodies are not free to vary their orbits. And in Daniel 10.13 we read, But the heavenly prince of the Persian kingdom stood opposed to me for twenty-one days, and behold, Michael, one of the foremost heavenly princes, came to buy aid. Daniel describes a confrontation between the heavenly forces appointed on behalf of the Persian kingdom and the people of Israel and describes that if not for the intervention of Michael, an angel appointed to look after the special interests of Israel, the opposing forces might have prevailed. So we see in, in uh, Daniel 10 that Gabriel comes to Daniel and explains to him that he's been at war with the Persian kingdom. And this is obviously in the celestial realm. This is uh, in, in the heavenly realm. And above all these kings or ministers appointed by God as his agents to look after the affairs of the nations of the earth, exclude Israel. So God appointed the highest angels, Michael and Gabriel, as the ministers of Israel and his agents towards Israel. But the affairs of all the other nations were still under the kings or the ministers that were appointed to them individually. And there is a supreme being from whom all others receive the parameters of their authority. The land of Israel in this respect and the Israeli people has always had rules of its own. The representatives of these various nations are described as kings. God, by comparison, being known as the king who is the supreme king, just as we have the term the supreme divinity, indicated that there are forces that are also perceived as divine but on a much lower level. And that's obviously the uh, what, Paul, what Paul speaks about when he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. So it's evident that in God's creation there is some sort of connection between the celestial realm and the terrestrial realm, which we can't really understand. But Paul goes on further to say, Even so we... When we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. And that's very much speaking about a physical perspective. And in Deuteronomy 4.19, it says, And lest thou lift up thine eyes to heaven, this is uh, to the children of Israel, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, should be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all the nations, 
under the whole heaven. So God divided the nations and assigned particular portions of the heavens to those nations which would have authority over those particular nations based on the angelic realm. And it's difficult to wrap our heads around this because it's not something that we can see, but we can go by scripture to sort of grasp through a, a, a dim fog of what it's talking about. And in Deuteronomy 32 verses 8, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. So that would have been 72. 72 people went into uh, Egypt, and so it's talking about the number, not the children of Israel themselves. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead them, and there was no strange God with them. And in Leviticus 20, 24, it says, But I have said unto you, you shall inherit the land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from the other people. In Numbers 23, 23, it says, Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob. This is Balaam trying to curse Israel. Neither is there any div divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? Balaam was so amazed that he couldn't practice his astrology and his divination on Israel. Because back then, it was such a prolific thing, that, and it, and it had power. You have to understand that this, the, the astrology back then and the things that were going on when the restrainer wasn't around, they had the ability to, to uh, work supernatural powers based on these things. And obviously, it's difficult to, for us to understand because the Holy Spirit is here and the restrainer is restraining them. But we can get a good idea, and you'll see as we go forward that uh, this is very much the prevailing um, situation back then. Rabbi Yohanan said, There is no constellation for the Jewish people that influences them. This is ancient uh, writings. The Jewish people are not subject to the influence of astrology. And Rabbi Yohanan follows his own reasoning, as Rabbi Yohanan said, From where is it derived, there is no constellation for the Jewish people. As it is stated, thus said the Lord, Learn not the way of the nations, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the nations are dismayed at them. The nations will be dismayed at them, but not the Jewish people. So God took the Jewish people out of the influence of astrology, but the rest of the nations were very much still under the influence of uh, divination and astrology. So starting off with Abraham, I think this is going to be an interesting perspective and based on his astrology and astronomy, which is recorded in ancient writings. The uh, Jewish scribe says when God revealed himself to Abraham at the Torah, the Torah reports that he took Abraham outside, showed him the stars and challenged him to count them. The Zohar, immediately following the part we've quoted previously, states that this verse means that Abraham was told to free himself from the limits which his astrological studies up to that point in his life imposed on him. When God asked him at the beginning of the chapter 12 to leave his father's house, the message is that as long as you adhere to part of your traditional philosophy, you will not achieve further philosophical spiritual success. In order to gain further insights, you must go to the land I will show you. So Abraham was living in a time around Nimrod when the nations were steeped in astrological divination and those kinds of occultic practices. And God waited about 500 years, as we'll see, for Abraham to come to know God by his own intellect, which is completely unique. As a result of this, Abraham overcame the limitations his belief in astrology had imposed on him. He was raised to a level beyond the shell of the sky, and for the first time he became privy to the visions beyond the realm of the natural. So this is when God first found faith in Abraham. And in Exodus 29:25 it says, I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And I will supervise their affairs without resorting to an intermediary. So the angels were the intermediaries between man and God, and those were the watchers. 
they will have no reason to be afraid of what astrology portends, seeing that they, the Jewish people, are far more honored than, by me than are the celestial planets. The very fact that I guide others' faith only by means of agents, intermediaries, testifies to the eternal existence of the Jewish people. And obviously that all changed when the Messiah came and he was executed. And in Joshua, it says, And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in an old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. So they're talking about the constellations of heaven being assigned to the watchers and the angels, and they did it before the flood, and the flood, and the flood came and destroyed them all, and they did it after the flood, which was... The idolatry um, of uh, Nimrod. And as long as Abraham's actions were not the result of instructions from God, he's not praised and his exploits are not specifically mentioned. So this is an interesting part where the reason why Abraham is only introduced in the Torah after he came to faith by God rather than his own intellect, we see that he's mentioned in the book of Jasher um, and it goes into much more detail in the book of Jasher and in the book of um, Jubilees. Even when he sanctified God's name by allowing himself to be thrown into Nimrod's furnace. So, so in the book of Jasher, Nimrod is thrown into Nimrod's furnace, just like Daniel was thrown into uh, the furnace with Nebuchadnezzar. But that's not in the Bible because he used his intellect rather than his faith. This is not reported in the Torah since this action demonstrated his in intellectual integrity only, not his faith. Faith is something that God demands from us. And this is uh, from the Jewish writings. Let me just add here that as far as the book of Jasher and the book of uh, Enoch and Jubilees is concerned, uh, we understand that those are not um, canon and they're not uh, inspired, but nevertheless they are books which are come to us at the end as knowledge has increased uh, the book of jubilees fills in the dates and the timelines the book of jasher fills in the dates between um uh, the flood and the patriarchs and israel leaving egypt so it fills in quite a lot of detail there and the book of enoch fills in what was going on before the flood so we shouldn't we shouldn't reject these outright because they are not in the canon and also interestingly enough there are 66 books in the bible and the book of jasher and the book of jubilees and two books of enoch would make another four so that would make 70. and these books were sacred enough to be kept in the jars which are found in the qumran caves in 1947 interestingly one year before israel came back the whoever hid those manuscripts in that jar found those these scrolls and these books to be sacred enough to to hide them along with the, the book of Isaiah so I don't think that we should uh, reject these texts outright they're very important at the time when the Torah introduces the personality of Abraham to the reader no such demand had been made upon him since no promise had been made to him either as compensation for demonstrating his faith Abraham's tremendous achievement was that though he did not have the tradition of a Noah since both his father and grandfather had been pagans so Abraham came out of a, a pagan history he began to develop his faith through an intellectual approach and Noah was obviously the descendants of Lamech and Methuselah and had that um, lineage all the way from from Adam so Adam, Abraham was totally unique as far as his, his intellectual ability and he found God with his mind at first, Abraham concentrated on demonstrating the complete bankruptcy of the belief held by his contemporaries, so those who were, who were around him, including his father. Afterwards, having traveled as far as it is possible to travel by means of one's intellect alone, with the help of God's personal providence, he arrived at that level of faith in his Creator, which the Torah describes as, He believed in the Lord, and the latter gave him credit for this. And God waited about 500 years for a man to find him with his own mind. Later, at the time of his circumcision, Abraham would be asked, walk in front of me, to demonstrate a degree of faith that surpasses what his intellect can comprehend. In this way, he would outclass Noah, who had only walked with God, his faith only keeping step with his intellectual faculties and never exceeding them. So that's why Abraham exceeds Noah. 
And looking at a comparison between Abraham and Noah, the Midrash describes the difference between Noah and Abraham in the story of the king who had two sons. To the younger one, the king said, walk with me. Whereas to the senior one, he said, walk ahead of me. Noah, whose faculties were limited, was told, go with me. Whereas Abraham, who possessed outstanding intellect, was told, walk in front of me. And uh, some more rabbinical views uh, about Noah is that he was as walking in clay and being rescued by God. Whereas Abraham was viewed by God as being confined to dark alleys. He proceeded to illuminate the alleys for God through a window. And God responded by suggesting that instead of illuminating a window in Mesopotamia, Abraham should illuminate the land of Canaan. Uh, and the, the Midrash's analysis is similar. Uh, Noah's faith was an uncritical acceptance of everything handed down by his father and therefore caused him to walk in darkness. And we know what happened after the uh, after the flood. He got drunk and, and um, certain things happened. And he needed God to enlighten him. Abraham, on the other hand, according to Rabbi Nehemiah, endeavored to illuminate the darkness surrounding the existence and knowledge of God by using his mind. So very interesting about Abraham. God extended his help to Abraham with both hands, as it says, for I know him, so that he will command his children and household after him to obey my commandments. This was the natural result of recognizing the existence of his creator. And that's uh, Genesis eighteen nineteen. So there would be no more astrological influence on the Jews after Abraham's promise through Isaac. So that's not to say that they didn't practice astronomy and astrology, because we, that's very clear throughout the writings um, which we find, but that they would no longer be subject to the uh, elements and the influence that the astronomical and astrological movements of the heavens would have on them, such as they are on the rest of the nations who are not Israel. As Rabbi Yohanan said, there is no constellation for the Jewish people that influences them. The Jewish people are not subject to the influence of astrology. And uh, Rabbi Yohanan follows his own reasoning. As Rabbi Yohanan said, from where is it derived that there is no constellation for the Jewish people? As it is stated, thus saith the Lord God, learn not the way of the nations and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the nations are dismayed at them. The nations will be dismayed at them, but not the Jewish people. So they had no influence on Israel. And the ultimate truth discovered by Abraham was that even the apparently ultimate causes of motion in the universe, the stars, must have someone who was responsible for setting them in motions in the first place and who controls their orbit. This conviction, once acquired, made Abraham engage in arguments with his contemporaries. This led God, without further ado, to promise Abraham the, the land of Canaan and command him to leave his homeland. Now I'm going to go into the astronomy and astrology in practice in the, that are in the writings left to us. And the prevailing idea that I'd like to get across is that it was very, very important back then. So I think that we should at least view the sign as being something which at least they would have considered as extremely important. Jasher 8. And it was in the night that Abraham was born that all the servants of Terah and all the wise men of Nimrod and his conjurers came and ate and drank in the house of terror and they rejoiced with him on that night and when all the wise men and conjurers went out from the house of terror they lifted up their eyes towards heaven that night to look at the stars and they saw and behold one very large star came from the east and ran in the heavens and he swallowed up the four stars from the four sides of heavens so this would have been Venus swallowing up Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, and Saturn, moving along and having a, a major conjunction, going through Venus and swallowing those stars up. And keep this in mind for, for later and what this is going to represent. And all the wise men of the king and his conjurers were astonished at the sight. And the sages understood this matter, and they knew its import. And they said to each other, This only betokens the child that has been born to terror this night, which is obviously Abram who will grow up and be fruitful and multiply and possess all the earth and he and his children forever and he and his seed will slay great kings. So here we see the night that Abraham was born was an astro astronomical and astrological sign with which the the uh, conjurers and the wise men knew the significance of. So they, they took the sign very, very, very seriously. 
And in Jubilees 12.16 it says, And in the sixth week, in the fifth year thereof, Abram sat up throughout the night on the new moon of the seventh month, that's Rosh Hashanah, to observe the stars from the evening to the morning. So Abram is observing the stars from the evening to the morning in order to see what would be the character of the year with regards to the rains. So he was looking from an astrological perspective to try and understand what was going to happen that year. This is Abram practicing astrology. Obviously not from a personal uh, perspective, but what was going to happen and occur from a situational perspective that year. And he was alone as he sat and observed, and a word came into his heart, and he said, All the signs of the stars and the signs of the moon and of the sun are all in the hand of the Lord. Why do I search them out? So this is Abraham starting to come to the realization that these things that he is practicing, that he that he was situated in a nation that was steeped in astrology and astronomy and um, superstition and these kinds of things, he's starting to realize that somebody must be in control of this. And uh, obviously that was his uh, beginning to realize that God was in control of it all. The sign of Moses, um, we read in the writings of Abarbanel, Rabbi Abraham ben Hia and Solomon ben Gabriel, they decreed that a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn preceded Moses by three years and should precede the Messiah. This conjunction is said to have happened before the birth of Moses in Pisces. Now, interestingly enough, I cannot find any other reference to this uh, sign that was in the heavens or this conjunction, which, which was supposed to have happened in Pisces. It's almost like it's been deliberately emitted from anywhere. But we know that at the time of uh, Pharaoh persecuting Israel and uh, m murdering the baby boys, this is pretty much the only thing that uh, refers to it in the Bible. It says, come on. Let us deal wisely with them. So this is about the children of Israel multiplying. Lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. So Pharaoh says here, let's deal wisely with them. And uh, if we look at what the text says in Jasher and we understand uh, who was involved there, which was Balaam. Uh, then we'll understand that the reason why Pharaoh did this was on the advice of Balaam that Balaam had given him. And Balaam uh, was working with Janus and Jambres. And Balaam is not mentioned in the Bible until such time as Israel has actually exited Egypt. But he is very definitely recognized in the book of Jasher and all the things that he's doing there. And the Jews recognize the fact that he was very much involved in Egypt. And uh, they, they actually say that uh, Balaam was to the Gentiles what um, Moses was to the um, the Jews. So looking at Balaam the diviner uh, a little closer. So what I'm trying to do is just uh, get across the idea that the astronomical and astrological things that were going on back then and how seriously they took them before the restrainer obviously came and the Holy Spirit came. And, uh, was uh, of paramount importance to the Gentile nations. So next we come to Balaam the diviner who was around at the time of Moses before the Exodus and uh, he was involved with advising Pharaoh. He was the one that advised Pharaoh to chuck the babies into the river but it doesn't tell us that in the Bible we're only introduced to Balaam after the Exodus when Balak asks Balaam to uh, curse Israel and he couldn't but that wasn't the first time. Balaam and Pharaoh are mentioned in Jasher, Jasher 61, and amongst the servants of the Angus was a youth 15 years old. Balaam, the son of Baal, was his name, and the youth was very wise and understood the art of witchcraft. And Angus said unto Balaam, Conjure for us, I pray thee, with witchcraft, that we may know who will prevail in this battle to which we are now to proceed. So Balaam divines for Angus and realizes that they're going to lose for Chittim, and he abandons Chit uh, Angus for Chittim, which at the time was ruled by Zepho and Hadad, the descendants of Esau and Ishmael. And there he's received with honor because of his incredible astrological and uh, divination skills. Zepho, the head of Chittim, asks Balaam to divine who will win the war against uh, Chittim and Egypt with the sons of Jacob. So you can see uh, this is before Israel left Egypt. But Balaam couldn't divine because he could not divine against 
Jacob because remember Abraham had been brought out and Israel were no longer under the influence of astrology. Zepho, Zepho goes up against the Egyptians who started to fight the war against Chittim without the sons of Jacob and, and, and began to lose and got desperate and asked the sons of Jacob to join them. Then 150 sons of Jacob slaughtered 6,000 of the army of Chittim uh, under Zepho. And the Egyptians became so afraid when they saw just 150 of the sons of Jacob defeating the army, which was defeating their entire army, that they began to retreat and they left the sons of Jacob alone. And Israel knew that they had been betrayed by the Egyptians and in the process of returning to Egypt killed 200 Egyptians on the pretext that they mistook the Egyptians for Ishmaelites and Edomites. And this is where we uh, enter into the uh, Torah, where we find the um, the wise men advising Pharaoh to, to deal with the Hebrews and the Israelites because of this incident. Uh, they, they got so afraid and they realized that, that the, the Hebrew nation was, was growing at such an alarming rate. And if 150 men could take out uh, 6,000 of the Chittim army and the Egyptians couldn't defeat them, you can see why uh, Pharaoh then dealt with the, Egypt, uh, with the Hebrews as he did. Then um, Balaam abandons Chittim, who had just lost this, uh, this war, for, for Egypt. And he came to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and there he was received with great honor. In Jasher it says, And Balaam dwelt in Egypt in honor with all the nobles of the king, and the nobles exalted him because they all coveted to learn his wisdom. What happens next is Pharaoh has a dream which Balaam interprets as the downfall of Egypt to one born of the house of Israel. And Balaam is the one who advises Pharaoh to chuck the Hebrew babies into the water. When Moses is three years old, he removes the crown from Pharaoh and places it on his own head. So they're sitting around a table uh, having a, a, a meal and Moses reaches up and takes the crown off of uh, Pharaoh's head and puts it on his own head. Balaam then identifies this as the child which was in Pharaoh's dream. So they're all in such shock that this child has just done this. And that this child would overthrow Egypt and uh, suggests to Pharaoh killing Moses. What they do then is they test the baby Moses by putting an onyx stone and a coal of fire before him. An onyx stone is uh, black and a coal of fire is, uh, is obviously also black. And the baby reaches for the onyx and the angel of the Lord directs Moses' hand to the coal, which does not burn Moses' hand. So Moses puts his hand on the coal and takes the coal and puts it to his mouth and burns his lips and tongue. And that is uh, rec recorded in Jasher 70:29. And they placed the boy before them, and the lad endeavored to stretch forth his hand to the onyx stone. But the angel of the Lord took his hand and placed it upon the coal, and the coal became extinguished in his hand, and he lifted it up, put it to his mouth, and burned part of his lips and part of his tongue. And he became heavy in mouth and tongue. So we see in Exodus 4:10, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither herefore too, for since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So this is an explanation of uh, why, why Moses couldn't speak properly. was because he had um, obviously burnt his mouth with a red hot coal. Balaam in the Bible as the astronomer, uh, astrologer, he is the one that says in Numbers 24, He shall pour the water out of his buckets and his seed shall be many waters and his king shall be higher than Agag and his kingdom shall be exalted. Balaam is talking about Aquarius. In Numbers 24, 8, God brought him forth out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn, a re'em, that's a, a, a bull. He shall eat up the nations with his enemies and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. That's Taurus. In uh, Numbers 24, 9, he crouched, he lay down, as it were, as a lion, as a great lion. Who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that bless blesseth thee and cursed is he that curseth thee and that's talking about Leo so we see that Balaam prophecies in the Bible and the prophecies that he is prophesying has to do with the constellations of heaven and Numbers 24 17 this is the star of the Magi that Balaam a Gentile prophet was prophesying I shall see him but not now I shall behold him but not now there shall come a star out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. 
Balaam was the one who prophesied the sign of the Magi. And then the revelation of Joseph to his brothers. The removal of Israel from the influences of the constellations does not mean that they were not able to interpret the information from the heavens. On the contrary, it would appear that they could do this better than anybody else. It means just that they were not subject to the influences of the constellations of heaven. And an incredible account in Jasher when uh, when Joseph sends his brothers to back to get his father, um, Jash, uh, he then uh, confers with Benjamin and uh, this is how he actually reveals himself to Benjamin. And he ordered them to bring before him his map of the stars, this is Joseph, whereby Joseph knew all the times. And Joseph said unto Benjamin, I have heard that the Hebrews are acquainted with all wisdom. Dost thou know anything of this? And obviously Joseph uh, learnt this from his fathers. And Benjamin said, Thy servant is knowing also in all the wisdom which my father taught me. And Joseph said unto Benjamin, Obviously Benjamin didn't realize that Joseph, who was now practically king of Egypt, Egypt was right in front of him. And Benjamin, uh, Joseph said unto Benjamin, Look now at this instrument. I'm not sure what that instrument is, but it had to do with the constellations of heavens and the stars, clearly. And understand where thy brother Joseph is in Egypt, who you said went down to Egypt. And Benjamin beheld that instrument with the map of the stars of heaven, and he was wise, and looked therein to know where his brother was. And Benjamin divided the whole land of Egypt into four divisions, and he found that he who was sitting upon the throne before him was his brother Joseph. And Benjamin wondered greatly, and when Joseph saw that his brother Benjamin was so much astonished, he said unto Benjamin, What hast thou seen, and why art thou astonished? And Benjamin said unto Joseph, I can see that this Joseph, my brother, sitteth here with me upon the throne. And Joseph said unto him, I am Joseph, thy brother. So this is a fantastic account of uh, Joseph and uh, Benjamin using astrology to to determine the times so i guess what i'm trying to get at is that this was so prolific so profound so uh, so evident and so um part of the culture back then that the revelation chapter 12 signs should not be ignored it shouldn't just be something which is just cast out of hand there are writings all over the hebrew uh, ancient hebrew writings over jewish writings in the book of jasher in the book of jubilees in the uh, in the book of Enoch, uh, where it says he he divided the constellations, so I don't think it's a good idea to just uh, um, dismiss it out of hand. In the Bible, Solomon describes a divine hi hierarchy. If thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a providence, marvel not at the matter, for he that is higher than the highest regardeth. And there be higher than they. This verse refers to the ladder which had served as the illustration for the composition of the universe as a three-tiered pyramid. God is described as towering above the ladder, the universe, exerting his influence on even the angels. The angels in turn exert their influence on the tier of the planetary system, which in turn exert their influence on the creatures in the terrestrial part of the universe. In other words, all the creatures in the terrestrial universe are subject to the direct influence of the planetary system. And you'll recall what Paul said, we were subject to the elements before we became saved. This was confirmation to Jacob that the validity of astrology as a discipline worth studying. These planets, etc., however, were not independent powers, but were presided over by the agents of God called angels, who in turn under the direct supervision of God himself. So there's this three-tiered system, God, the angels, the elements, and then man. Israel wasn't uh, subjected to that influence because they were directly under the supervision of God who had called them out. But then as you'll see, I think that they lost that when the Messiah came. When Shiloh came, then the scepter departed from Judah. They murdered the Messiah and, uh, and they became subject to those influences again. Uh, and the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, then took the people that were saved out of being uh, subject to those influences. And Solomon describes the system. Uh, the first part of the verse speaks of the injustice perpetrated in the terrestrial part of the universe. Solomon warns us not to jump to the conclusion that the world consists only of this part and that therefore the whole universe must be corrupt. 
we obviously don't know what's going on in the other dimensions, but the fallen angels are fallen and uh, the, uh, they're obviously going to be punished uh, because of their wickedness. But you see that this is what fits in perfectly with, uh, with the word of God and uh, an explanation of the terrestrial with the celestial elements and the stars and the heavens play a very important role. Um, clearly, that's uh, proven through historical writings. Justice does not exist and there are forces at work which are superior to those which are active in our terrestrial part of the universe. And the considerations which guide these forces are of the kind that we human beings often cannot understand because his reasoning is so much superior to our reasoning. And that's obviously his ways are above our ways. And looking a bit closer at the, the actual um, Hebrew of the verse, um, it says, If thou seest the oppressed of the poor and violent perverting of just judgment and justice in a province marvel not at the matter for he that is higher that is gabor than the highest that is the highest of man is regarding things and they be higher than they so the the word gabor gabor is used three times there so uh, god is in the supreme as the supreme divinity who has allocated the um the affairs of man to angels but not for those people who were the israelites before they murdered the messiah but uh after they murdered the messiah they became subject to those influences and then when the holy spirit came that's when the people who are saved are no longer subject to the influences of astrology and astron um, and divination etc also in Isaiah that it describes this this divine hierarchy Isaiah 24:21 and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth so you see the Lord is uh, uh, Jehovah and the angels are the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth are the Melech, Melech Adam and uh, you can see that they are going to both be punished on the earth so that's when the fallen angels come back to earth and uh, it's uh, mapped out perfectly in the Hebrew text just there. And Jesus is going to shake the heaven and the earth in Hebrew 12, 25. See that ye refuse him not that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on the earth, those are the Israelites, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now... He hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not earth only, but also heaven. Solomon's wisdom. And there came of all the people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. And in Ecclesiastes, all this I have proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and the largeness of heart even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all the men, than uh, Ethan, the Ezrahite, than Heman, and Chalcol, and Dada, and the sons of Mahal. And his fame was in all nations round about. So Solomon had incredible wisdom. Rabbinical writings ask, what did the wisdom of the Egyptians um, praise consist of? You will find that Solomon was about to build the temple and he sent a word to Pharaoh Necho asking him to supply him with artisans on loan to help him in the construction. How did Pharaoh answer the request? He consulted his astrologers to determine which of his artisans would not live throughout the year so they could tell who was going to die and who wasn't going to die in that year back then. Um, and then he dispatched them to Solomon. And when Solomon saw these people, he realized with the aid of the Holy Spirit that they were going to die during that year. And uh, he provided each one with a shroud and sent them back to Pharaoh with a note reading, Were you sure of, of shrouds in Egypt? Here I send your artisans back with a, a gift of shrouds. That's an interesting story about ast astrology. Israel set free from the powers on high. Some more ancient Jewish writings. The journeys of the Israelites described in the book of Numbers in such agonizing detail teach that contrary to prevailing opinion, shared by Jews who had just left a country that based its philosophy on astrology and astronomy. The timetable of these journeys was determined only by God, not by astrological data. 
The Jewish people did not know from one day to the next if they were going to break camp. Calendar analysis, proprietor's times for journeys were all factors which were completely ignored when it came to decisions when and in which direction they would move. So this was something that was completely unique. When Israel came out of Egypt, they were not going to be looking at uh, any astronomical or astrological data. Uh, and that was considered so unique because absolutely every other nation was doing it and was so involved and uh, dedicated to this manner of living that uh, this was something special that God was going to do that had nothing to do with uh, with the astrology and astronomy and the uh, influence by the heavens and the elements. We see Moses with the Amalekites. Uh, it says in Exodus, but Moses's hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hurd stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the one on the other side and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun so there's this really weird thing that that Moses has to keep his hands up and uh, the Jewish scribes say this is because the Amalekites had calculated the hours by astrology as to which hour they would prove victorious and Moses held back the sun against them and brought the hours into confusion and that's in uh, that's in the Midrash so who are the constellations not for Israel had the highest angels and ministers placed above them. In Daniel 10.13, again, it says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. That's Gabriel, the angel. One and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Daniel 10.20 says, Then he said, Knowest thou wherefore I came unto thee, and now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I'm gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. So there's stuff going on in the angelic realm, which the Hebrew scribes believe are directly associated with the constellations of heaven. And this matter is written, as it is said, Daniel said, let his heart be changed from a man. This is Nebuchadnezzar. And let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. Nebuchadnezzar was going to become a beast for seven years because of his pride. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High, again, there's that pyramid structure, ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the the basest of men. And in Numbers, again, uh, talking about what Balaam said uh, to uh, Balak over the divination of Israel. That there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and Israel, what hath God wrought? And Rabbi Johan says there is no constellation for the Jewish people that influences them. The Jewish people are not subject to the influence of astrology. Uh, and that is from uh, where is it, it is stated, Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the nations, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. So the signs of heaven are not for the Jewish people. For the nations are dismayed at them. The nations will be dismayed at them, but not the Jewish people. Who are the constellations for? Jonah prophecy to Nineveh, which was a Gentile nation that had just experienced the famous Bersagel eclipse in 736 BC. The book of Job is one of the few books in the Bible that is written by a Gentile, and by far the one with the greatest celestial content. Seven Gentile prophets prophesy to the nations of the world, and they are Balaam, his father Baal, Job, Eliphaz, uh, Bildad, Zophar, and uh, Elihu. So that's Job and his and his three friends. The Jews consider those were the uh, seven Gentile prophets that um, that prophesied to the nations of the world. So clearly, this is a, a, a Gentile thing. And it was Balaam the Gentile who prophesied the Bethlehem star rising. Leo, Taurus, and Aquarius. And uh, we've been through those verses. Uh, Balaam was the one who, who, who spoke of the constellations of heaven, guys, not the Jews. And it was the Gentile Magi who were watching for the Bethlehem star, who obviously believed in, in the Messiah. So we can see very clearly that the, the constellations are uh, not for the Jewish people and signs are, are not for the Jewish people themselves. 
I've read quite often people say that the sign is for Israel, and that's just not the case, as we can see. And the matter is that the honorable God created everything and placed the power over the ones below and the ones above and placed over each and every people in their lands according to their nations a star and a specific constellation as is known in astrology. And this is that which is stated. And lest thou lift thy eyes up to heaven and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven should be driven to worship them and serve them which the Lord thy God hath divided and to all the nations under the whole heaven. And in Deuteronomy 32, When the Most High divided the nations, their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. And in Leviticus it says, But I have said unto you, Ye shall inherit their land. That's the, the Israelites inheriting their land. And I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey, I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. So in summary, God took Israel out of being subject to the influences of the constellations. The swallowing up of the stars in the book of Jasher seen when Abraham was born was the representation of this. Israel were no longer going to be subject to divination and astrology and the constellations. He, they were going to be a unique nation which God himself was not going to have any intermediary with. Israel lost that protection when Shiloh came, when the Messiah came, because it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. When Messiah arrived, there was a sign in the constellations of heaven signifying that he would be in control of the world's nations under the rule of Israel and at that time Michael sat down and the last time we saw Gabriel uh, uh, give a message to Mary right before Messiah was born that was the last time we we hear mention of an angel but when Israel murdered him as prophecy they became again subject to the influences of the elements and had their special protection as a nation removed so you see this protection that they had uh, was then going to be transferred to the protection of the Messiah who had just arrived. But when they murdered Messiah, they, they lost that protection. And obviously the, the special protection was transferred to the people who had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in them. But that was until Israel gives birth to the church based on another sign in the constellations of heaven. Micah 5.3 says, Therefore will he give them up, until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brother shall return unto the children of Israel. And in uh, Daniel chapter 12, interestingly chapter 12, Michael stands up for the, for the nation of Israel and it says, Daniel 12, 1, At that time Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. But there will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. So that's kind of my understanding of uh, how it all works and fits together. Um, it's, I know it's, it's pretty out there, but um, it makes sense if you look at it from that perspective. I hope you enjoyed. God bless and Jesus loves you.